Welcome to God of Run. This is Will Sanchez. I have two very special guests today. Their names are Mary Darling, who runs for Hidwood Hounds, and Jeff Irvine, the founder of Bridget. Mary works for Bridget. Bridget's a very interesting organization. It started because its owner was bullied as an adult. I'm thrilled to have Mary and Jeff. Hi, Will. How are you? Hi, Will. Excellent. Before we get into Bridget, let's introduce you, Mary, to our audience. Tell us about where you were born and something about your childhood. Well, I'm the youngest of five children, and I'm 50 years old. And my oldest sister is 67, so my mother spaced us all five years, which was brave. But she wanted a big family, so that's how she did it. And um, I grew up in Long Island. I attended school there, and I got to running uh, because I used to play field hockey, and I wasn't very good, but I thought it was good, and I really liked the uniform and the way <laughs> I did my hair. And one day the coach came up to me and said, um, I'm going to take you over to meet the track coach. And I said, oh, okay, why? And she said, because you are really not a very good field hockey player, but you can run. It was in junior high. So at 14... I did not want to do this, but I did, and I went over and met Wally Conyers, who, shout out to him, I don't even know where he is, he's the best coach ever, and he, um, I ran the 800 for him a few times, and then um, I made varsity track in, when I was 14, and it was such a great feeling, and you know, you go where the accolades are, you grow, you, especially as a youth, and it was such a, um, such an important, part of my life running mm -hmm. and carried me through to university um, and then carried me through to my life. I really picked it up again. I, I've always run, but I really picked up the racing um, after about 39 years old. I went to um, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, uh, which was a little bit of a switch, but I was able to run there, which was great. It really taught me a lot and didn't always want to be that far from my family. Now, after college, you needed to decide a career for yourself. What was the process for that? Hmm. Okay, well, the process was <laughs> that whatever my sister, who was living in New York, was doing, I was going to do. So I worked, um, she told me it was great to be a stockbroker. So I thought, wow, that's great. So she got me a job at um, Oppenheimer, and I uh, was an assistant and got my Series 7, and uh, I worked as an assistant and then a, a stockbroker for a while where I met my husband and um, Mr. Darling. Mr. Darling. So I was able to change from Mary Brewer to Mary Darling. I was 23 and still married and I have two children. During that time were you active running around in terms of uh, track or? You know what I was running but it was the 80s. If It was uh, 87 and mm. Central Park looked very different. I think about it every day when I'm in that park, how different the park looked, how different the makeup of the people, and you know, coming home at, at night and running in the park, it just it, it didn't look the same. I mean, the park is so beautiful and safe now, and it really wasn't that, but uh -huh. I did run. I ran, ran often, I ran with a lot of men, and, uh, but I really didn't, I always ran, but I got very active in the New York uh, running scene through New York Roadrunners, but through my first person who saw me, and a shout out to oh, Jerry yeah. McCary, which oh. is how I know you, Will. Urban Athletics. Urban Athletics. And he saw me running one day, and we just chatted. Started to train with Urban Athletics on Tuesday nights, much to my husband's dismay. But um, <laughs> Why? Because you were away from home? <laughs> well, it was, they were 8 o'clock at night up at the armory. Okay. So, but I met great people, and it sparked my, it re sparked my interest in running again. Um, and that sort of set the tone, I would say, for my 40s, which was a great, a great time, you know, Excellent. raising children, running, Excellent. meeting people, different Excellent. people. Excellent. You mentioned Urban Athletics because now you run with the Henwood Hounds, but I met you at Urban Athletics because you were, I guess you were the hostess for a book signing. Yes. They had Tom Fleming as the feature speaker, and you were such a gracious host. Well. So, you know, thank you for that introduction. That was no, really great. Well, thank you. It was and Jerry is always so gracious in the running community and is very supportive, has been a great friend, both he and his wife. And, um, Cara McCarry. Cara. And they've just been, they've been With great. a beautiful baby. Beautiful. Jordan. Jordan, that's right. I but remember. she's a big girl now. She's adorable. 
Always go to Urban. I oh. encourage everybody to, but okay. anyway. But now you're a member of the Henwood Hound, so how did you make the switch over? I ran a little bit for another running team, and uh, I met John, uh, actually it was his first New York Marathon, or maybe his second, but I remember seeing this person running. It was, I think it was his 213 marathon he ran. Unbelievable at, what was this, 35 years old, and... Uh, I was injured, I was sort of trying to come back, and we talked after that, and aside from becoming one of my greatest friends, um, he really helped me get back on the track to racing again, and marathoning, and track work, and things like that. So, he's, it's, it's been a good fit, and I've met some really unbelievable lifelong friends at Henwood Hounds. We mentioned at the beginning this Bridget school thing, so, so that's a very significant <laughs> organization or move. So what led you to, to Bridget? At about 45 years old or 44, um, I decided I was going to go back to school. And so I went to NYU and got a social work degree, uh, something I always wanted to do. Um, I wasn't going to become a professional runner. So I thought maybe I should do something else. And I've, I've served on boards. I, I'm on the society board for Memorial Sloan Kettering. I do a lot of charity work, but it just, I felt like it would, it would be, I, it was something else. It kind of fit into my life, um, social work. And through that, I have always run, speaking of running and how this is so, uh, or continuous in my life, is I, uh, one of my greatest running pals was Jeff Irvine's wife. She and I became friends, became running partners. We did, I think, Gosh, London two or three times together, although she's a lot faster than me. Jeff and I became great friends, as well as my husband and our children became friends. Oh, okay. So I was going to social work school. Jeff was starting this business. The Bridget right, business. The Bridget, the Bridget business. business. And Jeff, uh, we talked a lot about it. And then Jeff, I'm not going to say you pushed me, but you didn't push me, but you encouraged me. I'm going to say Jeff encouraged me with... Because being a social worker, you have, you're, you're giving out resources. And um, so with that, I love to network people together. I, I think it's a, a strength of mine. Uh, people have been so kind to me in my life. Um, and through networking, through I know somebody. New Yorkers are great about networking somebody. Mm -hmm. How did I meet you? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's people are friendly. People come up. People want to help. People want to connect. Okay. Okay, well, let's turn it over to Jeff here. <laughs> So tell us why it was necessary to find Bridget. If you had asked me 20 years ago would I be talk here talking today about Bridget, the answer would be no. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I'm a CPA by training. I went to Columbia Business School, got an MBA in finance. I worked on Wall Street as a banker and then ran hedge funds and private equity funds. So that's what I did for the first 15 or 20 years of my professional life. Unfortunately, I was introduced to someone who was a bad person. I figured it out, and uh, I gave the evidence over to the FBI, and that person ended up going for, to jail. Uh, but you discovered a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, it pre-Madoff, I discovered pre a, small, a small Ponzi scheme. And, and you turned that information over to the FBI. To the FBI. And, and they, they took action. And they took action. They got convicted. They got put away. And then they got out of jail a few years later and then got deported outside the country. And then they put up a website that attacked me. And so it was, it was revenge. And they went up and they basically described me as a bad person and a horrible person just like them. And the internet today, it's written in ink. And so people Google you first and they ask questions later. So all of a sudden, I went from a very outgoing, gregarious person, uh, very positive and proactive, to a person who was worried about everyone Googling me and figuring out recourse mechanisms on how do I fix my problem. It's not true. When someone posts something online that's not true, how do you get it down? Mm -hmm. and, and so I spent the next four and a half years learning how to do that, uh, creating nexus where I could to en engage the courts and learning everything about the law, privacy and digital privacy, and ultimately I, it led me to conflict resolution and restorative justice, which was all about solving the problems of, 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 of bullying, not only with adults, but with kids who really need it. I hear you, but that's amazing. 42 years old, but yet your character was totally assassinated, defamed, because somebody could put up a website and do and say anything about you, and you had no recourse.
here's what I did. I, I started Googling everything. I got my lawyers involved. I went to the US ISP that was hosting the site. I got them to take it down because I said it is defamation per se. I became an expert in defamation, defamation per se in the US and 140 other countries where they have laws in place. The person who did it pull, put it, went to another ISP, internet service provider, who could post the content, of the web, host the website in Belize, which had no treaties with the US, so I couldn't do anything there. And then I started to go after Belize, and he moved it to Belarus and Eastern Europe. And so it very quickly became a question of, he's just going to keep moving this site and keeping it up as long as he wants to, to inflict harm, maximum damage on me. I ultimately, I engaged him in court in federal district court under Chief Judge Holderman, one of the leading IP lawyers in the country. Um, and I was able to get Nexus there through a credit card receipt of all things. And then we served him and we served him electronically. He'd been deported out of the country. And he was so arrogant and such a, so much the sociopath that he thought he would win based on, on the current laws in the US that he accepted service electronically. I'm one of the few people that's ever served someone electronically <laughs> anywhere in the world and they've accepted service. You are a pioneer in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> so then I spent the next three and a half years in court proving my case and I finally won. And I did this because I'd gone first to Google and said, please take this down, it's defamation per se. They're like, we don't take anything down without a judgment. So I had to go through the law, but the law hasn't kept up with technology, which the judge, when he finally did rule, and I went before him in the court, I said, you know, this has really changed my life, but it's not only affected me, it's affected my family, my kids, all my social relationships. My whole social support group had totally a different opinion about me, whether they said so or not. Ultimately solved my problem, but yeah. I met all these kids and parents of kids who were either having had to, had to be pulled out of school permanently now because you couldn't put them back into school someplace else because the internet is everywhere, or kids who were cutting, or kids who had taken their lives already. So as I was finding my solutions, I was along this journey and I met all these people who had it so much worse than I did. And I was like, no one's solving this problem. We're just letting it get worse. The answers are out there. And the researchers had them in restorative justice and character education and social emotional learning. What had thrown the curveball into the equation was the internet, because you could be anonymous in terms of attacking or communicating. A lot of times it's not meant to attack, it's just poor communication. We don't teach our kids how to use, how to communicate on social media. We don't model behavior. We do on a face-to-face -face level, and we have forever, but how do you model digital behavior? What classes do you go to? What do your parents tell you? How do you, how do you this describe? Is, this is the big unknown. Right. That's right. So as we started to look at the problem and we looked at the whole problem from beginning to end, we're like, we need, it's about community. It's about support, right? Kids need to find their support groups and they need their social groups. And that's what they spend a lot of time in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. They try and establish themselves. Well, now they try and establish themselves both on a face-to-face -face level, but also on a digital level. And so we're not giving them the amount of education and understanding about themselves and those around them that they need. So, so what is Bridget? Bridget School is a digital platform that incorporates incident reporting, management, and resolutions to mitigate harmful behavior in school communities, both on and off campus and on and offline. With Bridget, schools will be able to understand the scope of their problems. Bridget's going to give us the tools to truly define what bullying is. Bridget allows you to notify parents, staff, and security about an incident instantly and confidentially from any computer, tablet, or smartphone with just a few clicks. Quickly learn of harmful behavior. Access real-time data of your school's climate. Implement restorative responses that have both short and long-term results. Comply easily with state-mandated reporting requirements. If my school had had Bridget, I think that I wouldn't have just been the only one receiving help. I think the people that were bullying me might have been helped too. This tool with Bridget will actually become a deterrent. And this is going to change lives. It's going to change everything. Bullying is the problem, and Bridget is the solution. Okay, so let's, let me describe a scenario here. I'm going back in time, I'm 12 years old again, and, uh, <laughs> and my friend steals lunch money away from me. Because of technology, the bullies can reach Junior even after he goes home. Mean messages and texts go around the clock, but Junior's parents and teachers can't see them. 
Like many kids, Junior isn't comfortable having a face-to-face -face conversation with an adult. What if the bullies see him in the office? Junior feels like he has nowhere to turn. I'm encouraged to report this incident. Right, to communicate it. To communicate it. It's not anonymous because that's one of the problems. They know who's, who's right. Right. having the problem. You would log in, you'd hit about four or five different icons that said, oh, it was stealing, it happened in the cafeteria, and it was, didn't have any bias involved, but, um, and you might write, I'm upset because of this, that, and the other thing. Okay, and, and who then, sees that? Who's and got to it report? goes to moderators at the school. Who handles all the social emotional problems now, the behavioral incidents? Generally, the, principal. The, the, principal. The, the assistant principal, right. the principal, and the counselor. So okay. it's usually three or four people. Okay, so because kids uh, are afraid to talk to an adult about it, could, okay, let me do it online. It takes the risk down. This the is risk a, rate. It's a so. behavioral risk management tool. When we launch Bridget, we go in and we give education to the parents, the students, and the teachers, and the moderators who are going to manage it. So we'll go in and talk strategy with them. So they get it. They do their evaluation as to whether or not it's true. Maybe it's bullying. Maybe it's not bullying. Uh, maybe it's a fight, which isn't bullying. Maybe it's false, it's just teasing, but you want to get the information and the communication. Because it's all about teaching the kids to get understanding about what the problem is and why what they said or did hurt or bothered someone else. So that they can get to understanding, hopefully they'll get to remorse so that they'll change the behavior. Okay. Usually, if you're bullying somebody, you're probably bullying other things, like your family pet. You probably not, don't have a good home life. I mean, it's complicated. We've sure. seen that. It's We've very seen complicated. that, well, a lot, and that's really... Yeah. So how do you help the bullier, not the bully? So, we, so today, because of digital technology and the way young people communicate, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent is online, we don't really, we're not there to judge the bully or the bullied. We're there to help them both. Okay. We provide support activities for the victims or the, the people that are targeted, and we provide support activities and restorative support activities to the bullies. So instead of the bully typically getting a, going to detention and sitting at a desk for half an hour, he still may get a detention, but he'll get a reflective, a ref, a reflective exercise. Now, I think, Mary, you mentioned that every school in New York State has to have a reporting system that if there's an incident of uh, yes. bullying or harassment or somebody is harming themselves, they have to report that. So I think Bridget has that kind of component as well to, yes. to yeah. generate right. that. Well, our whole we'll track idea, that. Yeah, we can track that. We have a whole workflow for, that makes it very easy to manage the situations. You get real-time uh, feedback loops. So principals can see now see we assess on the academic side all the time and we t teach the test and everything like that so we know exactly where our kids are academically but now you'll be able to see exactly where they are socially if they're if they're upset if they're withdrawing if if they're being bullied or not yes yes what percentage do you have any numbers what percentage of school kids are bullied um, pretty much 80% of all kids are bullied at some point in our time. 80%? 80%. Amazing. Talk Number. about the a bystander. That's the issue. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 85% the, the of all incidents of bullying that go on in the schools are seen either by a teacher or by students. And so being an upstander, which is saying something or standing up, doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because on a face-to-face -face level, the risk is too great. Because if someone's an upstander, the likelihood of them becoming a target is very high. Mm -hmm. And so they won't take that risk. And so that's why we wanted to use technology, because the kids are constantly working on, on, on their phones and make it very easy for them to communicate anonymously to the rest of the community, confidentially to someone in authority who is tasked oh, with the So you encourage bystanders to take some action and report it on the Bridget app absolutely. so that things can happen. It's That's to, interesting. It's to everyone's benefit. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. This is, this is a severe problem. And, uh, and you see it today. I mean, uh, you know Tina Fey, the, the famous comedian. Yes. yes. She admits she was a bully in high school, a mean girl. She was a mean girl. Right. Hence, and she described it her, as a disease. Do you see bullying as a disease? Is there a shot you can take? Well, I think it's interesting. That's a great question, Will, only because we, Jeff has said from the beginning, this is a wellness issue. And it's interesting because a lot of the insurance companies, um, insurance companies are dealing with this as well, and we've been working with them. But also uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, one in particular, um, 
when we went and spoke at a bullying summit and did a workshop, they, they're sponsoring this. And so they're going into each school. They've got 35 schools that they're going in, um, and they're addressing the problem. And that's, they've engaged uh, Bridget only because now you can map that issue. You can map it and then get, then get the remedy for it, get, the, get, get help is on the way. And just one other statistic, Jeff, is 5%. You, you say, you know, Bridget works even if it's only 5% of the community is reporting. That's great. You've changed, you've changed the, the, the way people communicate um, and the culture of the community. Oh, that's 5%. Interesting. That's it, interesting. It's almost like ADT. If you're a Bridget school and parents, teachers, and students all have the ability to report in a uniform manner within eight or 10 seconds that quickly, now you're going to create a level of accountability and transparency that's that, that hasn't, that's been it's lacking. It's a code. Right, right. But just to follow something what Mary said, so you're saying there's a tipping point where you don't need 100% participation. No. If you can get this tipping point, you said 5%? 5%. That's, that's great. That will make a, a significant difference in the culture. Exactly. And, and, and another statistic that I think is, is great and one that's, I, I know, and one that's been spoken back to me at, at workshops we've taken or uh, summits that we've gone to is you can put a reading readiness program in any school across the country and you will not get the percentage that you uh, uptick that you will get by putting a bullying, uh, a bullying or anti-bullying platform in the school. It's 11 percent. If, 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 if a, happy, a happy school or happy kids make a happy school and, I, and the, grade, the grade point goes up 11 yeah. percent. You won't get that for a math readiness program, reading readiness. So across the board, it's, it's, not ju it's, it's so important. It's, oh, absolutely. And, and absolutely. the more I work with Jeff, the more I'm working at Bridget and hearing stories and looking at the statistics from the, from the studies and just looking at it in our schools, seeing in our schools, it's a big difference. You know, um, we're almost run out of time, but I want to cover a couple of things. In, in, in prepping for this interview, I did some, you know, some online Googling. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if it's written on the internet, it must be true. Must be true. Must well. be true. I didn't realize. I mean, the, not everything. No, I, know. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't realize there are like over 50 different programs in, that schools can go to besides Bridget. What makes your program different, unique? Why should a school consider yours? Because our program is unique in the sense that it integrates the best of technology with the best of character education in real time. There is nothing like ours. There are a lot of great social emotional learning programs out there in curricula, and we don't pick any one over the other. In, put it in today. We embrace it. We yeah. embrace it. But the technology allows you to see the behavioral relationships of those in your community for the first time. No one has that. No student information system. Nobody out there has really put that together, and mm -hmm. we have. So you can now see over time by problem type how different students are interacting with other students. You can identify outliers early and get them the support they need. Excellent. And Excellent. it's sustainable. Well, it's a sustainable solution. It's turnkey. If you have a, a turn, turnover in administration, this is, the, the, this is something that doesn't, d doesn't require one person leaving to make it, to reactivate it again. It's, um, you, should, you should, every parent, when they walk into a school, and I can tell you I did not do this when my children were applying to schools or going to school, every parent should ask um, an administrator upon that child entering school, what is your platform on bullying? How do you deal with situations? And if they say nothing, as one of our top principals said, Dominic D'Angelo, pull the kid out. Pull the kid out. That's interesting. Tie into that because of, uh, of shootings and, and, oh. uh, and so forth. You know, what's your emergency plan to take care of kids? Right. So it goes hand in hand. You know, if, Absolutely. if there's... You need a plan. You got a plan for these things. So yours is a planning tool. So how to, besides word of mouth, because you've been doing this for a couple of years and you're probably in dozens of schools at this point in time, hundreds of schools. We, we spent a couple of years just working on the product with the schools to get it right. And we launched our first cohort of schools this past fall. So we're in over 13 schools right 13 now. Schools. So how do schools and parents get your program to their they can go online to Bridget.com, B-R-I-D-G-I-T.com, and sign up and ask us to do a WebEx or come to their schools and speak. And we also do tutorials and trainings for, for teachers and parents and students alike. Okay.
And then, uh, and then finally, this is not unique to the United States. Do other countries have uh, bullying problems? Are, are, are we the leaders in bullying, or <laughs> it, the problem is? You'd think, it, but no. The problem is everywhere, and nobody has their hands around it because it's over, so overwhelming, and the digital aspects have made it overwhelming. Right now, we're in talks with the Ministry of Education in Puerto Rico. We have other Central and South American countries. I'm translating it into the software into Arabic and uh, Albanian as well. The, you, all you have to do is go online and start to Google stories about different things that are going on. The problem is everywhere. Oh, that's, that's a shame. But hopefully, we can use social media for good as well. And then, if, Mary, let's go back to your running. You're, I think you said you're injured now, so you're not running? I am running. You are running. Because, as you know, you're a runner, Will. Even you, though we're injured, we run. It's, it's that or the Looney Tune farm. No, um, I'm running, but uh, not competing and missing it. But I'm out there cheering friends and family on. Great. Yeah. So, but hopefully I'll be back. And I'm in a new age group at 50. So. To 50. So, so new personal best coming up. Well, I don't know. Have you seen the women out there? <laughs> oh, like like Stacy Creamer and yeah, uh, those, or, those well, are great. I don't think Fiona Bailey's 50 yet. But please don't be 50 yet, <laughs> Fiona. I'm hoping for a comeback, but I, I don't know. And I want to say um, also Clark Keo, who you had on is a great friend, and he's done incredible things with his running. So that's my shout-out to you, Clark. He's going to do great at Boston if he gets to the starting line uninjured. No, he okay. is. Okay. All right. So we wish you the best on your, on your running. Thank you. And Thanks so back. much, Will. And thank you so much. And, and I really appreciate you hearing uh, my story, but also with Jeff, because it really, running led me to this and, and just really enjoying it. And it's been a work in progress. And no one works harder than Jeff it, Irvine. Uh, it's an important work, and I, and I give you all the credit that you were able to resolve your problem after four and a half years, probably cost you your fortune, but you were able to give back to the community, to give back to society after resolving your problem. You're an expert now on bullying and, and all its aspects. So I congratulate you for, for taking on this immense and important task. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.